I guess we'll get started. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for attending our workshop on studying abroad. We're so excited for having you all here. Um, and yeah, let's get started. Okay, everyone. Um, so hello, my name is Maggie Duran. I've been in the Qantas family for about 10 years now. Um, and I have, um, sorry about that. <laughs> I have a variety of different positions throughout those years. Um, I'm approaching my fifth year at UC Davis as a microbiology and Spanish double major. I'm also a student assistant at the study abroad office at Davis, which you know, ties into the whole thing for today. And my study abroad journey actually led me there. Um, and so I studied abroad in 2018 in Mendoza, Argentina. Um, hi everyone, I'm Kenza Chowdhury. Uh, I've had, I have been part of the Qantas family for about eight years now and also holding different board positions throughout the years. I'm a recent UC Davis graduate. Um, I have a BA in international relations with an emphasis in people and nationalities. Um, I also have two minors, one in communications, the other in professional writing. And I also studied abroad. I studied in Sydney, Australia this past fall 2019. And so this is kind of an overview for your guys' information about what we'll be discussing. So um, we're going to go through some COVID-19 concerns because, you know, we are in a global um, pandemic. So we wanted to acknowledge that. Um, then we'll be discussing some traditional pathways for studying abroad while going into some alternatives that you guys can consider. And since we're a community service organization, we have some, you know, information about engaging in community service. And then we'll be delving into our own experiences as well as the benefits of studying abroad. And at the very end, we'll be having a Q&A for you all. We do ask that you hold um, all questions to the end if possible. You can go ahead and leave them in the chat and we'll address them at the end. Or if you'd like to speak later on, please feel free to do so. Um, but since we're trying to keep time in mind, that's one consideration. Um, so moving on, we have our COVID-19 concerns. Uh, as we're aware, since this convention is online, uh, we are in the midst of a global pandemic. And so this workshop, the purpose of this workshop is not to encourage you to go travel everywhere all at once, you know, right now, but hopefully that will be able to equip you with some of the skills and tool sets that you'll need if you choose to study abroad um, in the traditional sense in uh, at some time in the future. Or if, you know, maybe you're approaching some of your ending years of undergrad and you would like a taste of study abroad or some global education, we'll also present some alternatives to the traditional methods of studying abroad um, so that you can get a sense for that as well. And I'll be discussing the traditional pathways. Okay, so one of the questions I get a lot at the office is, how do I choose a program? You know, students come in, they're really, um, they're excited about the idea of studying abroad, but they don't know where to start. And so one of the things I think is really important is to think about your goals, you know, what do you want to achieve? Uh, is your goal to go to another country to learn a language and immerse yourself in culture? Or, you know, is there a particular skill set you'd really like to develop? Maybe, you know, you really, um, have like a particular health internship in mind that you're interested in engaging in in another country uh, or you want to try something completely different you know we have uh, stem majors who have tried our design in japan program just because they're interested in you know experiencing another part of the world but you know with something completely different that they're not used to so it's kind of um, a good idea to think about how your particular program fits into your overall academic planning goals and it may not be directly related but it'll definitely be an enriching experience for sure um, and then you can always connect with others about the particular program type you're interested in but then also you know if you have fellow peers who've been on other study abroad experiences or you know university personnel who are really invested in these programs that the schools are offering they're a really great resource um, to talk to and communicate with as well um, and while I can thinking about your program there are some things that you should consider before studying abroad um, you may have questions like where do you want to uh, go what kind of climate or weather our season will be in the area. For instance, in the US from like September to never, uh, September to November, it's fall, but in Australia, it's springtime. So um, yeah, thinking about that, your length of duration, like, do you want to spend a semester there? Do you want to spend a quarter there or a year there? So um, thinking about that along with where you're going to stay, do you want to consider homestay or apartments? Um, there are pros and cons for both of them. Um, with homestay, I found that it's a little bit cheaper. You get to live with the local family and it's just, just a good way to get yourself integrated with local life a little bit better. You can also gain some insights that you wouldn't have if you were by yourself in like an apartment, for example. Um, and with 
homestays, um, it depends on your program. Um, most have your meals provided or you can even cook your own. Um, some may have rules to follow like a curfew. Um, it's just talking it out with your program and seeing what's best for you for homestay. And for apartments, um, apartments tend to be a bit closer to campus. They have a bit more privacy and you have more independence. Um, you may share your apartment with some other students studying abroad. Um, and for that, you know, you, can, you, have, you may have to cook your own food and just, you know, go according to your own time. So there's perks for both. And apartments tend to be a little bit cheap, um, expensive, not cheap. But um, so there's a lot of things to consider um, with that. Um, also, with your program, do you want to do a language immersion um, and completely integrate into that culture? And if you do, um, you may want to have some pre previous knowledge of the language there or choose a program that allows you to learn it while you're um, studying abroad over there. Along with it, there's a lot of stuff like the budget, having, uh, making sure that you prepare some money for, you know, amenities, uh, souvenirs, even emergencies, having your travel docs um, and visas, making sure you get the visas for each of the countries that you want to visit prepared beforehand um, and making copies of these documents because, you know, they're very important. And if you do happen to lose, like, say, your passport, for instance, you can head over to your respective embassy and, you know, um, you communicate with them and your program uh, coordinators as well and do your research you know figure out what sites you want to visit um, there's plenty of historical and cultural sites you know ask your friends watch travel vlogs just have an idea of where you want to go and when you do that make sure you accommodate some days for traveling and studying because you are a student studying abroad and you know just make sure you're aware of the cultural do's and don'ts um be respectful of the culture and um you know open-minded about the whole experience because um yeah And you may be wondering, how will I finance this whole trip? Um, there are financial resources available for you to visit. So um, first and foremost, we always recommend you checking out your study abroad office website. They most likely will have a whole web page dedicated to um, information and resources that you should check out. Um, then you should probably, you know, check in with your school. You know, they have like web pages, like on your financial aid website, dedicated for scholarship opportunities and links for that. Um, there's also major specific uh, and even program specific scholarships. I know for mine, I uh, had a. Uh, I'm an international relation major and they had specifically a study abroad scholarship for um, the majors uh, students um, and for program there's also like for Australia we were able to like part uh, apply for a scholarship specifically for that and there's also outside organizations like the Kiwanis scholarships um, every year the Kiwanis uh, organization they have scholarships you can check out and apply for um, so you know we have a link available afterwards you can click there or you can even google um, there's also the Benjamin A. Gilman International Scholarship it's available for U.S. Uh, residents um, only it's based on your financial e needs so um, if you're a U.S. resident this is definitely a good resource to check out and one thing to keep in mind with some of these scholarship opportunities is that they may require you to fill out an application or do like statement of purpose essays. Um, some may even require letters of rec. So um, for me, we had to have an academic and professional letter of rec. So just make sure you know, communicate with your professors, go to office hours, build that bond so that when you ask them, um, they'll be willing to write you one. And even ask your Kiwanis advisor, they'll be down to write you one. Definitely a lot of great advice. Um, another thing that you can consider is looking into maybe like a special type of scholarship. Mm -hmm. so, um, personally, something that I did was um, I went back to different groups that I had volunteered with in the past, so during my high school years, and I uh, kind of laid out my entire plan for them. And I said, you know, I'm interested in doing this thing for these reasons, and I'm also raising funds in these different ways. Would you be able to consider some sort of special scholarship to help me achieve my study abroad dreams? And um, it was a really, it was a nice way to connect with some of those groups I'd been to in the past. They're like, of course, yeah, we would love to support you. Here's a couple hundred dollars. Would you be willing to come back and present to us? Of course, I love talking about study abroad. Um, but so that was like a really, it was a unique way, but it was also difficult because I found it hard to ask for money. So 
taking that step is definitely challenging, but more often than not, these are people who want to see you succeed and want to help you. And so they're more than willing to invest some money in you for a better and brighter future. Um, and so another thing you can look into are online fundraisers or fundraisers in general. So you can start like a GoFundMe, share your story on social media, talk about why you're passionate about studying abroad and why you think it'll be um, the best option for you and how can it, how it can um, enrich your education. And then uh, other things you can do are just get, you know, a temporary job. Maybe you start walking dogs over the course of the summer or you do some yard work for some neighbors, um, set a flat fee, and then, you know, eventually they talk to their friends and then you're recruited by them and, you know, it just keeps building up. Or use your creativity. Maybe you really enjoy making cards or, um, you know, or baking or something like that. And so you can go and sell those types of things and you know, bump up the prices a little bit and say, hey, I'm doing this thing, would you be willing to support me? And um, you'd be surprised with how much you can kind of pull into those different types of uh, fundraisers. And um, if you have the ambition, you can definitely make it happen for sure. Mm -hmm. And so Kansa and I have put together a little bit of a checklist. Um, and so these slides will be available to you after the presentation for sure. So you'll have this available, but just kind of like a summary of all the things we think are pretty important in the planning process. Um, and then also we would advise looking up into, once you're closer to the actual program itself, you know, looking into more detailed packing lists to see specifically, you know, what kinds of power adapters you might need or certain types of clothing, those sorts of things. But um, it's a resource here for you. And here's like a snippet of inspiration. Um, make sure to travel everywhere that you can and capture the moments because, you know, they'll last you a lifetime. And here's a photo of Bondi Beach that I was able to take on my first day there. So beautiful. And now we'll be discussing some of the alternatives that you can consider. So considering that we're in a global pandemic, studying abroad physically is not necessarily the best option right now. So we have provided two alternatives for you guys to consider. One is virtual learning and the other is domestic programs. So with virtual learning, it's basically, you know, having an online experience, um, kind of doing like Zoom calls with, um, uh, at a school in a different country. So many institutions are now transitioning um, their education abroad programs to a virtual online format during this pandemic. And you can check in with your study abroad office to see what programs are available and what um, just get more information about um, your options uh, that are available for you. Um, and along with that, there's also, you know, virtual internships. So if you had an internship that got canceled, you know, you can look into some virtual internships in other countries. Um, and it would be similar, you know, like do a Zoom call there. So um, it, it just really depends. You got to do your research and figure out what works best for you. And even besides that, you can also experience it via photos and videos, search up travel vlogs, and, you know, you can still gain that insight into the different cultures uh, via that way. Um, besides virtual learning, there's also domestic programs. With studying abroad, it's mainly kind of gaining an insight to a different perspective. So you can still um, participate in opportunities within your own country. So just look into programs that may provide an open-minded experience just in a different setting from what you're normally used to. Um, it's still, you know, a good experience. It'll allow you to gain insight into different perspectives. Um, and it's just something that you should consider if you cannot physically go to the country that you wish to visit. Sure. Oh, and another uh, resource, which we have you know, mentioned a few times before, is contacting your study abroad office to find out more. A lot of times they will have a website or resources online that you can check into. Um, if they don't have a very strong website or not everything's listed, you can always give them a call. And if your school doesn't have um, a study abroad center or a resource like this, I would highly recommend looking at other schools' resources. Um, you could, you know, look up different universities and see what they have listed. They may be limited in that um, the opportunities they have listed are for their student body specifically, but it's definitely a good place to start and to find um, different pathways to find what internships or opportunities or um, virtual learning experiences are out there that you may be interested in. Um, but there's a ton of information online and since the current climate and um, how everything's going is constantly changing, there may even be more virtual learning opportunities available moving forward, uh, depending on how things end up. Sure. Yeah, so this is a photo that I took when I was in Argentina. This is near um, Aconcagua, which is a very tall mountain <laughs> in um, 
over in like the Argentina Chile border. And so um, we highly recommend that you explore every opportunity. Okay, uh, for our next topic, engaging in community service. Now, it may be tempting to, um, you know, when you're thinking about studying abroad, just say, oh, I'll just connect with some local groups who are there in the country that I'm studying with. Well, that may not be the case. Um, for particular programs, there are actually some restrictions on whether or not you can uh, complete community service, like for those programs, and that's usually just a matter of safety. Um, the program coordinators and such haven't necessarily uh, worked with those groups in the past and so they can't guarantee the student safety which is usually the top priority and so if it is something you're interested in I would highly recommend checking in with either um, a program coordinator, faculty member, person in charge, just kind of like a leader or organizer to see if um, it would be an option or could be an option. Um, not to discourage you from you know engaging in community service while abroad but just make sure you're not violating any aspects of uh, your contract for the program because it could be caused to send you home or there could be other restrictions or implications involved. Um, another element of kind of service learning abroad uh, is through the SDGs, which are the Sustainable Development Goals. And these are a set of 17 goals set forth by the UN. And it's kind of like an overview of the main um, things that the UN has identified as main problems uh, that we face globally as global challenges. And so here's a little bit of information about them. Um, there's a link that we provide, but um, you can also look into nonprofits and organizations that emphasize the SDGs as kind of like part of their mission statement and see uh, and use it as kind of like a springboard for finding more opportunities or learning other information. And even if you don't end up studying abroad, you know, this is something you can look into for a future career. If you know there's a particular SDG that really aligns with your values. And so here's um, a graphic from the UN that gives an overview of them. And we're just going to go through these slides a little bit quickly um, since we'll be available afterwards. And then here's some information um, about the SDG specifically provided by uh, Rob Davis, who's a member of the study abroad office at UC Davis. And so he had some information with a QR code uh, for more information about the SDGs if anyone's interested. And now we will be talking about our own experiences studying abroad. The fun part. <laughs> the fun part. <laughs> the fun part. <laughs> um, so, uh, hi, I'm Kenza again. <laughs> I studied abroad in Sydney, Australia, and my specific program was professional writing and an internship. Uh, I studied abroad this past fall in 2019, which is right before the major fires broke out. Um, but there were some small fires there, and um, I was able to experience a bit of that. Um, and while I was there, I was in a home state, actually, and my family was rather large. <laughs> I was with um, a couple, their three kids, one was five, three, and one, and I was with their grandparent or their parents, um, a housemate, and even a dog. So it was pretty packed, um, but I had my own room and it was really um, a good experience for me because they had a lot of recommendations. Um, they welcomed me into their own family, like they um, helped, they made me attend some of their family gatherings. I was able to experience, uh, you know, being at home in their home. Uh, uh, while I was there, uh, I participated in the UC Davis faculty-led program. So I was with uh, like 12 or 11 other UC Davis students, and we basically studied together just in um, a, a Sydney school. So one of the universities there, we had a room and we studied there. And while I was there, we studied uh, three different university writing program courses. One was travel writing, the other touched upon literature, and the third actually was um, Australian culture. So we had a local just take us on a bunch of field trips around the city of Sydney. And um, most of these writing courses, they complemented my travel experience and we were able to do like travel journals every week. And I'm so happy because now I have those memories written down for me to refer back to um, whenever I want. And that's because I forgot to do a travel journal while I was there <laughs> for myself. Um, but this was really beneficial for me because I was able to fulfill a majority of my professional writing. My uh, minor requirements. And while I was there, I also participated in an internship at Action Aid Australia, which is a nonprofit organization that helps uh, fight, helps women fight against injustices. 
I was able to gain uh, around 200 plus hours uh, working there. And it allowed me to gain an insight into the Australian work life. Um, we found out that, you know, businesses close around 5 p.m., which is, which is normal for here, but like everything closes around 5 p.m. So um, and some restaurants may be open, but I had to get used to the idea of starting my day early and ending it a bit earlier than when I was used to. And um, along with that, like uh, I was able to take some side trips. I went to Cairns up in Queensland and um, also see the Great Barrier Reef. And I was also able to visit Queenstown, New Zealand. So this is some of what I did <laughs> while I was abroad. And I went to a lot of beaches, as you can see. Um, so these are some photos of, you know, some Sydney snapshots. Um, well, the first day I was there, like after orientation, um, me and my friends, we decided to take like the ferry down and explore Sydney for what it was. And one of the first things we saw was the Opera House. That is literally what Australia means to me. <laughs> so I was so excited to visit there. And we saw the Harbour Bridge. And um, there's also a photo of uh, La, uh, La Perouse by Botany Bay. It's super beautiful. Um, and at night, we went to the Darling Harbor on every Saturday night. I believe they had fireworks going off. And I never got to see them, but it's OK. <laughs> I'm sure it was fun. Um, but yeah, so this was like Sydney for me. And then moving on, um, the program that I participated in had a lot of um, excursions built into it. So every weekend was booked for us to do something. Uh, one of the first things that we did was we went on a trip to Featherdale Park, which is like a wildlife reserve where they had like some cute animals like kangaroos. It took me so many shots, but I finally got a photo with a kangaroo over there. Um, and then afterwards, we went hiking up the Blue Mountains and I got to see the three sisters super amazing the three sisters are the, the three mountain tops that you see in the left hand corner we also went kayaking in bandina fun fact i don't know how to swim so <laughs> um, we didn't really tell the, the guide that so it's okay i had a, a life vest on me me and my partner we had a fun time crashing into some walls but it was an overall really fun experience um and I did a lot of side trips out, outside of the excursions that our program had planned for us. I visited the capital, Canberra, and we went to the Parliament House. It was so cool to actually go inside it and see the different houses, uh, the, the rooms for the House of Reps and the Senate. And while we were there, they were having their annual, like, um, Canberra was having their annual, like, Soriad Festival, which is, like, an arrangement of beautiful flowers. It's super amazing. And a fun story for me was I really wanted to hold a koala. And you can't really hold koalas in most uh, of the states. Um, we went to, when we went to Cairns, which is like the Florida of Australia for me, um, this was like two hours before our flight. We took a skyroll up to Karanda and we were just exploring and we found out there was koalas. And we got there and uh, they had a koala holding experience for 30 minutes only. Koalas can be only held 30 days and specifically that individual koala can only wear three days in a row and then they have to be given rest because you know they sleep for a long time and this koala was so cute it was sleepy it's not actually soft their fur is actually coarse but i was so excited this was like two hours or one hour before my flight uh, <laughs> back to sydney so yeah i did a lot of traveling anytime any weekend that was free i was out exploring and um like i mentioned one of my side trips was to canes canes is the Florida, Australia, because it's very humid and there's a lot of gators there, but I didn't really see any gators, which is perfectly okay with me. Um, we had uh, three days while we were there and the first day we went on this rainforest waterfall tour. We went up to, I believe it's called the Atherton Tablelands, this rainforest with, and um, they had a bunch of waterfalls. So in the middle, you can see Josephine waterfalls. It's like this waterfall slide and you could like go up and like slide down. I couldn't participate because I don't know how to swim, but it was super fun watching everybody have a, a blast and I was able to take cool photos. There's also Milo Milo Falls, which is really um, iconic. And on the second day, we actually went on a snorkeling tour. So I was super afraid to go snorkeling. Um, 
but you know my friends convinced me they said I would be in perfectly good hands and I was I had a life vest I had a pool noodle I was holding onto a lifesaver there was even a guide who was leading me so all I had to do was kick and enjoy the whole experience and we were able to see a bunch of sea creatures um, I didn't see any Nemo's but it was okay or clownfish but it was okay I saw him in the aquarium um, we did see some coral but it wasn't as vibrant as you would think there was a lot of you know coral bleaching happening so because of the rising temperature of the water you know the coral are dying off but my friend was able to get a cool shot of this very vibrant pink coral um, but it was really fun experience <laughs> And while I was traveling, I was also studying. I was also working. <laughs> and while I was working, I was um, working for ActionAid Australia. And um, it's a movement of women standing to claim their human rights and campaigning against injustice. And as you can see, they had three main objectives, which is economic justice for women, women's rights in emergencies, and climate justice for women. So while I was there, I was actually a communications intern. And one of my major projects was helping with their annual comedy show called Frocking Hilarious. Um, it's a comedy show with an uh, all women lineup and they raise um, funds for you know helping women and actually in Australia out. Um, it was super cool. I was able to call a bunch of sponsorships. I booked like a hot air balloon flight for some lucky winners um, and it was like in Melbourne so I wasn't able to go but it was it was really fun helping to you know uh, make this event happen and while I was there I was also able to participate in some of their major events like their 10th anniversary um, and it was overall really amazing experience and I learned something cool there that I want to share with you all it's called the power clap of the Vinatu woman so basically you clap and you put your hands away from you and that's power to you and then you clap and then you bring it to yourself and that's power to me. So you go, power to you, power to me. And it was such an empowering, you know, clap to do at the end of the day. So I'm glad I shared it with you guys. All right, thank you, Kansa. That's a beautiful story. Um, and so for my study abroad experience, I also did a UC Davis faculty led program. Um, and so that's just like a so small subset of study abroad. So like our programs were um, really designed to, you know, have like planned excursions and, you know, you have like a, a very set forward schedule. But there are a lot of study abroad programs that aren't necessarily formatted. So if you are interested in something more like that, that is an option. Um, but as, as for the program itself, um, I did a language immersion program in Argentina in uh, the fall quarter of 2018. And uh, the focus was language and um, culture for my particular program. And so when I came to college, one of my goals was to become like fluently bilingual. And so I was like, you know, studying abroad would be such a really, like such a cool opportunity to do that. Like, wow, it's such a far off dream. Like, it won't ever be possible. And then it actually happened. And I like still to this day, I'm like partially in disbelief. But um, for this particular program, one of the reasons I chose this program specifically was because I thought I was just going to satisfy my minor requirements. And then after I came back and was taking more Spanish classes at Davis, I was like, you know, looking at my schedule, all, I only need a couple more classes to actually double major. So like my program actually led me down the path of a double major that I hadn't anticipated, which is kind of cool. Um, but during the program itself, we did uh, trips to Patagonia, and that's that photo with all of like the pretty yellow flowers that was taken in Patagonia. And then Aconcagua, which is, we didn't actually climb Aconcagua because that's like a huge mountain, but um, the snowy regions, that, and so that like that bottom right hand uh, picture was from that hike. And then um, we took side trips, or a group of my friends and I took a side trip to Chile. And then after the program was over, I went to Iguazu Falls and Concepcion del Uruguay by myself, actually, which was kind of like nerve wracking and crazy because I'm definitely not that kind of person, or at least before the program started, I never envisioned myself as that kind of person. And so the program really helped bolster my confidence in the Spanish language, which was really cool because the majority of my Spanish just consists of, you know, what I've learned in school. And so um, when I went on this program, I was in the advanced level, which is the third level. And so um, my homestay, I did my homestay, I, um, I had, it was just my host mom. She had uh, children, but they weren't living at home at the time. And so um, it was mostly like her and I for the majority of the, of the program, but she didn't know any English. And so it really helped put me outside of my comfort zone. And I learned to become uncomfortable or comfortable with the uncomfortable. Uh, there was a lot of smiling and nodding though, that's for sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then that sort of the waterfall down there, that's, that was taken at Igosu Falls. 
Um, and so I took lots of photos of food. Um, and so this quote over on the side was from a restaurant that I visited, I believe when I was in Chile. Um, and it says, disfruta, come y bebe que la vida es breve, which basically means like eat, drink, and enjoy life like it's short, which I really enjoy. I thought that was like a nice kind of summation of what I hold true. Um, but one of the really big things about Argentina is asado, our barbecue. And so like I have a couple pictures of that. Um, one of the interesting things about my program specifically is that, um, so my host mom was vegetarian and I personally can't eat gluten or dairy. So like that definitely was like the navigating those dietary challenges, which I thought like could present an issue actually ended up not being too much of an issue, which was really nice. So um, studying abroad, if you have dietary restrictions is possible. Um, and so here's a few photos from like the, the area that I actually lived in. The cats, those were the cats that lived at my homestay. And then this middle photo, like a mural, is actually right outside my host mom's house. And so um, that was, those symbols are, are from her organization. She's a profesora de biodanza, which is professor of bio dance. And essentially it's like therapy through movement and music. And so her studio is right next door to her house. So even though I was like an only child, we had so many people coming through our home and like I got to meet so many different kinds of people that it was a really enriching, enriching and cool experience because I think I met people from Egypt, other people from Chile, like there was a lot of um, diversity that I was exposed to, which was really cool. And um, so within the first couple of days I was there, she's like, hey, you wanna help me with this mural? And I was like, sure, why not? So um, it was cool to have like a hands-on project that I was really focused on for the first few days and kind of get my footing a little bit and have something um, to focus on lives adjusting to all my new surroundings. And then um, the photo all the way over to the right is a vessel for yerba mate. And so that's a very um, common South American drink. Essentially, you put a bunch of um, crushed tea leaves into the vessel itself and then fill it with hot water. And then the straw is filtered so that you know, you're not sucking up tea leaves all the time. But essentially, like someone will have like the yerba and then um, like we'll pass, pass it around from person to person. And so like it's a very communal communal cultural bonding sort of thing so like when you know you're sitting with your host family just passing around mate like it's a really uh, it's a really cool unique experience and it really helps me feel like part of the culture there and so that's something that I personally really love a lot and will always carry with me which is really cool um, and so these are photos from uh, Mendoza itself and so this bottom corner um, to the left or is a, a photo that I took right outside the gates to um, the university that I was studying at. And so at that particular um, university, I was taking four classes and then like two units of um, like a, an additional kind of like reflection course. And so I took uh, one class that was focused on culture, another class focused on cinema, one that was on literature, and then a final one that had uh, a linguistics emphasis. And so we had class four days a week. And then um, on Fridays, a lot of times those would overlap with like our excursions and things, so we didn't have um, class those particular days. I wrote a ton of essays. I think that's one of like the coolest things that I can, um, for my study abroad experience academically, is that I can actually like track my progress and see how my language skills change during that time. Just looking at like, you know, the first essay I wrote to the last essay I wrote while abroad. And um, an even cooler marker, so I originally registered for an upper division Spanish class the spring before I left my trip. I sat down in the class and was like, okay, I don't really know what my professor's talking about and I can't do any of these readings because I don't understand what I'm reading. So I think I'm gonna wait to do this until after I come back. And so then I did my study abroad program, came back the following spring, registered for the same class with the same instructor, same readings, you know, everything. And sat down in class, first day I was like, wow, a year ago versus now, this is insane. Like I understood everything he was saying. I could do the readings just fine. Like it, the class went from extremely difficult to like, okay, this is definitely manageable. And so like that difference over just the course of a quarter of like really in-depth intense language immersion was really impactful, um, not just personally, but academically as well. Um, and so here's a few shots of some of like the really cool nature and excursions we did. Um, Mendoza is wine country, and so we visited a lot of wineries while we were there, and then lots of beautiful shots from Patagonia, again, some more snow, snowy shots from um, Aconcagua, and then Iguazu Falls was also a really, really beautiful and amazing experience. So lots of cool memories and lots of gorgeous nature. 
Um, and now we'll be talking about some of the benefits of studying abroad. Um, you may be wondering why study abroad? What should I, what will I gain out of it? Well, me, Maggie and I can definitely vouch for it. It's an experience that will last you a lifetime. Um, you'll gain a lot of practical life and even job skills out of it. For me, for instance, like intercultural communication, uh, interpersonal communication, um, you gain global connections and can, that, you, that will last you uh, for a while, like a long time while you're job hunting. Um, you'll be able to network. Like I have um, connections with my ActionAid Australia internship now. Um, not only that, you gain a fresh perspective by being exposed to other cultures. You now have a deeper understanding and it's just, you know, it makes you appreciative of the, of the fact that, you know, we're all more similar than we are different. Um, yeah. I agree 110%. Yeah, and you know, you always hear those super cliche things of study abroad is life changing, but it is, it really is. We promise it is. <laughs> Ultimately, the experience is what you make of it for yourself. And so, if you, you know, invest yourself in the experience, you take risks, reasonable risks, not crazy risks, we don't want you to end up in the hospital. Um, but, you know, those kinds of things to like push yourself self and challenge yourself, you will see those personal changes and growth. And it's it's really cool to be able to, to have those experiences. Um, and so Kansa and I both think that, you know, it's really important to have a global mindset, especially in the, the nature of today's society. We are so interconnected with people from all over the world and um, we are a global community of people. And so the challenges that one group faces, you know, even if it's on the other side of the country are collectively essentially all of our problems as well. And so, um, you know, trying to to connect with people from other backgrounds and learning how to communicate with people from all walks of life is a really valuable skill set and it's um, really you know mind opening and can be super inspiring as well um, and you know from a practical standpoint a lot of times employers will look for those kinds of unique experiences in order to select you out as a candidate and say okay well yes this person may have this 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 an experience but you know this individual actually went to the country and dealt with the problems that they said they wanted to tackle or you know this person has connected with people from this region and they're known for you know this particular process for this machinery and so like i think they would be a better candidate for the position um, there's a lot of a lot of tie-ins and a lot of um, connections that way so definitely um very practical as well as you know, inspirational and motivational but um, Kans and I both believe that one should not feel limited when obtaining a global education. And now it's like time for a Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them down in the chat box or feel free to just unmute yourself even. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have like a couple minutes for that. And if you don't have any pressing questions, we do have some frequently asked questions available as well. We do, we do. So we'll just give like a minute for everyone, you know digest, absorb digest. all the information we've given you. <laughs> we know it went kind of fast, but. Um, you know, fun fact, you know, some of those photos there, um, that's actually in the middle on the bottom one, that's New Zealand. <laughs> I wasn't able to include New Zealand on other slides, but that was pretty cool too. Mm. Anything on studying abroad for master's program? Ooh, that's a great question. A I don't question. know um, specific, like programs like in particular, but um, if you're interested in studying abroad for a master's program, you might want to connect with like the school that you're studying at or interested in studying at to see if they have options for furthering your education past undergrad. They might have like a specific program or um, an internship or something that is available. I'm, I, I can't guarantee, but I'm almost 100% sure that, um, that those programs are out there and available. They might be, really specific um but depending on what your focus is i think you should be able to find something and then olivia asked did you have did you guys have a country in mind when looking for study abroad programs well personally for me uh i was open to whatever fit my like major requirements because studying abroad like well actually i could study anywhere for me it was just getting 10 weeks abroad um but i wanted to find a program that actually was something like had courses that i would be interested in and that would like um, support like my education overall and for me like my parents um, it was hard convincing them to let me go abroad and so my mom was like you have to choose either England or Australia because she has some uh, cousins over there that I never met but I was like you know what I, I'm gonna actually go with Australia because um, 
I really wanted to visit it and the program, the minor, um, there were so many benefits, the internship, it was like, okay, the whole package was amazing for me. And I was also able to connect with some family members that I only heard about. And now I have a cool bond, like a strong bond with them. And then um, for my particular case, so I knew that I wanted to do a language immersion program and I'd never been out of the country before. So I definitely wanted something more structured, you know, with people like trust and, um, the faculty member that went on that that leads my program she's actually been doing this program for years and years and years and is originally from argentina so that was like a, a bit of comfort for me personally and my parents for sure um but for my my goals and my ambitions there were actually only two programs that i could do that were really like language immersion focused and um one was in spain during spring quarter and one was in fall in argentina and since i was completing the minor at the time the Argentina program was the one that was recommended if you were going for minor purposes. And so I went on that particular program, mostly out of academic reasons. And then, you know, meeting with program, um, with my academic advisors and such, they were like, yeah, this will work well with your schedule. And so it was kind of like process of elimination, really, because I had, I had really wanted to go to Spain. I was like, you know, I really want to, to spend time in Spain. Like, I think that'd be really cool. Like, but Ultimately, I'm really, really, really glad that I ended up going to Argentina and that that was, you know, the way my path ended up leading me to because it was amazing. Um, Kylie asked, did you guys stay in touch with CKI during your time sitting abroad? Fun fact, I was actually the Kiwanis family chair that year. So, and uh, me and my partner, we stayed in touch and I was uh, still partaking in my positions while abroad. We actually had a key to college the weekend, right? Like the first weekend I was there. So I called in to make sure everything was running smoothly and I kept in touch, made sure, um, to, you know, participate whenever I can during board meetings. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, it's, it's easy to stay in touch. Like they're on Facebook, you know, the time difference didn't really matter much because my friends are always up really late. <laughs> so it worked out. And I know some, uh, Krishma said, um, uh, were there any accommodations for conditions like food allergies? Would you have to work it out prior? Maggie? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's a great question, Karishma. Um, so yes, definitely something to consult with the, the program coordinators or individuals who are in charge of the program before departing. Um, usually the process is that like they'll send out a questionnaire with kind of like, do you have any food allergies or restrictions or considerations we should keep in mind? And more often than not, they're able to accommodate um, or make special considerations. Like I know because I let them know about my circumstances beforehand, sometimes they would bring um, like gluten-free items on certain excursions, like when we were all together as a group, or make sure that I had something um, that was available. If you have like really severe food allergies, I'm sure that those can be accommodated for as well, just as well, just as long as that line of communication is open and those who are, you know, in charge of in charge of essentially are aware of um, the circumstances. Um, Alicia asked, do you know a website where non-US residents can apply for scholarships to study abroad? Unfortunately, I don't think we have any links in our particular presentation with that, but I'm sure if you look into um, your study abroad office, they'll probably have links for scholarships available that you can check out. It's looking into the requirements, actually. I know there's a bunch of scholarships that, you know, you have to be specifically U.S. resident or, or wherever you're from, uh, uh, residents from there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maggie, do you have any? Yeah, I don't know of any websites in particular, but I'm sure if you did like some thorough Google searches on um, you know, scholarships for study abroad, non-U.S. resident that you could get a few web pages up, even if um, it wasn't through like, your school in particular. There should yeah, be something out there. Yeah, one of the major first things I did was Google scholarships. Um, uh, Moninder asked, how was the visa process? Was it difficult or fairly easy to get one? Um, for me, I, um, the study abroad office coordinators they actually sent me the link to where i was supposed to get the visa it was specifically like a student visa that you had to apply for for a couple of months i was freaking out because i got the mail was in my spam so i found out about it like a month later but i applied it was asking a bunch of questions and there was a small fee um but i got the notification that my visa was approved like 10 minutes later so but it honestly depends on your specific um situation because um, someone I know for, it thought they finished their visa but it wasn't approved and then they got to the airport they got to um, LAX which is in LA um, and they were rejected so they weren't able to go to the program unfortunately so making sure that your visas are approved ahead of time is um, 
important. And it's somewhat easy for some countries because when I applied for the visa for New Zealand, I, re- I literally applied like three days before my flight. So um, I, would, I would recommend like a, a longer you know, time beforehand, but um, just making sure you have all of that approved ahead of time because they will ask for it. And some of them are like e-visas. So you may not have it physically stamped on your passport, but you have it of, like they, when you um, check in, they, it will notify the um, airport or airline. Looks like we're about out of time. So here's yeah. our slide just real quick give thanks to um, yeah. the resources we access during our presentation and thank you all so much for being present today um, we really love talking about this topic and if you have any questions at all please feel free to reach out to either of us through email we'd be more than happy to discuss things further thank you so much everyone we really appreciate it thank you have a great rest of your convention and wonderful rest of your day wonderful <laughs> bye